Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 161. Day day 3161 the 3 is to signify the fact that we are in the third edition third edition day 161 and today we are about to start section 6 of the second test second practice test practice test number 2 that you will find at the very end of the book on page number 489 make sure the book is in front of you turn to page number 489 and let's begin problem number 1 problem number 1 says that we have a circle that is inscribed in a square with the sides of length 5. So let's do that first. Let's, let's draw a picture here. So let's first draw a square. Let's draw a square with the, with the sides of 5. It has a size of 5 everywhere. And we're going to inscribe a circle inside it, which means this is going to touch, it's going to be tangent. There we go. What a beautiful looking circle. Now, as you can see there, as you can see there, the diameter is 5. The diameter of this circle is 5. We are, and then we are asked to compare the circumference to, to, the, to 15. Circumference as we know is simply 2 pi r, 2 pi r, which can be written as pi times pi times 2 r, which is simply pi times the diameter. Circumference is simply pi times the diameter. The diameter we know is 5, the circumference is simply pi times 5. And pi, pi we know is something more than 15. 3.14 something, something more than 15. We, we don't have to worry about the exact value. Just understand that it's something more than 15, uh, something more than 3 rather. So if you multiply something that is more than 3 by 5, what will end up here is something more than 15. What we're claiming here is that the circumference of this circle, whatever it is, is something more than 15 because it's 5 times pi and pi is something more than 3. So here we have a quantity that is something more than 15 and in column B, we're given exactly 15 and therefore column A is bigger. Very simple, very straightforward. So straightforward, in fact, that three quarters of the people, three quarters of the people who took the exam, had no trouble with it. Seventy-three percent of people got it right. Let's move on to number two. Number two. Number two says, well, we're given two in two 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 equations. First equation is two times u plus v equals fourteen, and the second equation that we're told is u times v, u times v equals 0. Let's see what we can do. In column A, in column A we have quantity u, and in column B we have quantity v. Let's start with this equation here. Understand what does it mean what does it mean when we say the product of two quantities is zero? The product of two quantities is zero. Well, if u times v is zero, then that in turn implies that in turn implies that either either u is equal to zero. In that case, it doesn't matter what the value of v is. If u is zero, zero times anything is zero, or or v is equal to zero. Of course, there is also a third possible scenario, which is they are both equal to zero. These are the three possible scenarios. Either if a times b is equal to zero, then either a is equal to zero, or b is equal to zero, or they're both equal to zero. But that's where the problem lies. We're not interested in the fact that they both might be zero. That's not, but if they are both zero, the answer will be c here. That is also a possibility. If they are both zero, the answer answer would that case, answer would that case be c. But that is that is ruled out here because if they are both zero, we have to also satisfy the second equation. Second equation tells us that 2 times u, if u is 0, this is 0 plus 0 does not equal 14. So c is not possible here. They cannot both be 0. They have ruled out that possibility. They cannot both be 0. But but that does that does not rule out the fact that either u is 0 or v is 0. That is a possibility. Understand, this is not, this is either or. This is not and. We are not saying u is equal to 0 and v is equal to 0. That is not what we are saying here. That is not that is not what this equation tells us. 
If the product of two quantities is equal to zero, one more time, if A times B is equal to zero, that does not mean that they, they both, it does that not necessarily mean that both A and B have to equal to zero. The reason I keep saying A and B is because it's easier to, to speak in terms of A and B as opposed to U and V, but you get the idea. So if U times V is equal to zero, then either U is equal to zero or V is equal to zero or they are both zero, which, which, which is not possible here. So that's what it is. We don't have to do anything. How can you tell which one is it? Maybe u is equal to zero, or maybe v is equal to zero. If u is equal to zero, if you put it in here, if u is equal to zero, v would be 14. And on the other hand, if v is equal to zero, if v is equal to zero, if you put zero here, two times u equals 14, in this case, u would be seven. If you don't know what's going on. We can't really tell which one is zero. The answer is D. In case you're curious again, 69% of people had no troubles. 69% of people had no trouble. Let's move on to number three. Number three says, in column A we have, in column A we have 950 raised to 2000, and in column B we have 10 raised to 6000. 10 raised to 6,000. Let's see what we can do. Somehow, somehow, ideally, what we, what we like to do when we're given something like this is to make the basis the same. Here, it'll be difficult to make both of the bases 950 or both of the bases 10. That, that's almost impossible here. So, we'll do the best that we can do. You understand? Well, it's not impossible. It can be done, but that requires calculation. That's not the point here. So, let's see what we can do here. Can we write... Can we write 10 raised to 6,000 as 10 raised to 3 times 2,000? <coughs> Excuse me. Can we write 10 raised to 6,000 as 10 raised to 3 times 2,000? Why not? And can we write that in turn? Can we write that in turn as 10 raised to 3 and then 2,000 outside? Of course. And 10 raised to 3 we know is 1,000. So there you go, we have it. 1,000 raised to 2. 1,000 raised to 2,000 or 950 raised to 2,000. Which one do you suppose is going to be bigger? 1,000 raised to 2,000 or 950 raised to 2,000? Of course, 1,000 raised to. The answer is B. The answer is B. Almost, almost two thirds of the people who took the exam had no trouble with it. 64 percent. 64 percent of people. Let's move on to number five. Number five says that we have two sets, set A and set B. Number, we are at number four, rather. Number four, we are still on the same page. We have set A. We are told that set A has 40 integers. We can say that set A has 40 integers, or 40 elements, or 40 members. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It contains 40 of something. And set B has 150 integers. Column A is total number of total number of integers, total number of integers that are in set A or set B, or both, and we have to compare it against column B, which has 170. This is a very simple test to, to see if you understand the most fundamental concept of set theory, Venn diagram that is. And if you're weak on Venn diagram, the search for, I should have done this ahead of time, I don't have it with me, but uh, in this series, somewhere uh, in the last few days, we did 10 problems dealing with Venn diagram, either 5 or 10. Uh, if I remember it, tomorrow's video, next video, I'm going to write down here where to find the videos on Venn diagram in this series, in the, in the third edition series. But that's what this is. Very simple concept. So we have set A, we are told, has 40 integers. Here's, here's our set A, it has 40 integers. We have set B. We are told set B has 150 integers. 
Oh, I left out something very important. Then they go on to say that I left out something very important. I'm going to put it on the top here. Without, without that, we cannot progress. We are told that the common elements, common elements, or if you like, the common members are 20. What does it mean? Of course, the book does not phrase it that. But let me read the question to you as it appears in the book. It says, set A contains 40 integers. Set B cons con 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 consists of 150 integers. The number of integers that are in both set A and set B is 20. Number of integers that appear in both set A and set B, the number of integers that are common to both of these set is 20. Which is what we're saying here, the common elements are 20. What do we do with that information? So there are 20 integers that appear in both set A and set B. They are common, they appear here. But when we say that set A has 40 integers, this is telling set A has 40 integers, in that 40 integers, these 20 are included. It just so happens that this 20 also happen to belong to set B. So as soon as we insert 20 here, as soon as we insert 20 here, we have to take away 20 from here because those 20 are already those 20 were already included in this 40. If we were not to change this quantity, we will end up double counting them. Do you understand? Similarly, when we say set B has 150 members, in those 150 members, 20 are such that they also belong to A. So as soon as we indicate how many belong to also A in the common area, as soon as we indicate how many are common to both of them, we have to go and adjust that figure to 130. We have to subtract 20 from there, because otherwise we will end up counting those 20 twice. We don't want to double count anything. Out of those 150, out of those 150, 20 of them also belong to A. So only 130 belong to B. O. Do you understand? So let's find out then. Let's find out the answer here. So what does this 20 represent? This 20 represents, that 20 represents the number of integers that belong to only A. Only set A. What does this 130 represent? This 130 represents the number of number of elements, number of members, number of integers that belong to only set, set B. 130 belong to only set B. And then we have 20 that belong to both. That can be 20 that belong to both set A and set B. And that's how many we have total. And that's what we have in the first column. It says total number of integers that are in set A, right here. Set A or set B or both. The both part is down here. What we need to understand here is that when they say set A, here we mean only set A. When we say number of integers that belong to set B, here in this in this context, this 130 represents a number that that uh, that they belong to only set B, and then there are 20 that belong to both of them, and that's what we have in this column. If we add them up, we get 170, and in the second column, that's exactly what we have: 170 versus 170. The answer is C. The answer is C. The 170 was there for a reason, you understand? answer is C. The reason I took so much time to explain this thing in that much detail is because I was looking at the percentile and it's not quite a happy situation. Only about two-fifths of the people got it right. Three-fifths of the people almost missed it. Let's look at number five. You're done with it? Just give me a short break. there so I won't forget it. In the next video I'll tell you the videos that, uh, that you can go back and look at to get some more practice on set theory if you happen to be one of those 60% of people who missed it. Number five. Number five and I believe now we are on the next page. Page 490. Yes. We are told that x is a negative integer. It has to be a whole number. It has to be a whole number and it must be negative. That's the condition we have to fulfill. Here is column A. Here is column B. In column A we have 2 raised to x and in column B we have 
3 raised to x plus 1. The quickest, the simplest, the most economical way is to simply plug in some numbers and get going. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Let's plug in, let's plug in x equal to, well it has to be whole number, it has to be negative. The very first one that comes from my mind, the very first number that comes to, comes to one's mind when one is picturing the number line, on the number line you have 0 and then after, on the left hand side the very first one you see is negative 1. So we'll just start our story with negative 1 and see what happens. We may have to try twice, we may have to try three times, we'll see. When x is equal to negative 1, we have 2 raised to negative 1. 2 raised to negative 1 is same as 1 over half, 1 over 2, 1 half. And here, when x is negative 1, we have negative 1 plus and a positive 1, we have 3 raised to, 3 raised to 0. And as we know, any number, doesn't matter which number it is, any number, n represents any number. 3, 3000, 37, 2.4, negative 37, 3 quarter, doesn't matter. Any, any number raised to 0, any number raised to 0 is 1. That's something we have to know. Any number raised to 0 is 1. So 3 raised to 0 is 1. So here we have 1 half, here we have 1. Uh, in, this, in this scenario, the answer is B. The question is, do we stop here? Do we pick B and move on? Or should we try at least one more time? And that's your call. I would try one more time. Do you understand? You can't just try one time and just... just take your chance because if you just try one time and, uh, and, and move on what we are claiming here is that the quantity in column B is always greater. How can we be sure that it is always, always, always greater? Just try trying once. You've got to try it at least two or three times. You understand? Well, let's try x equal to negative two. Now it turns out that the, in the second try we get the conflicting answer then we are done. If you don't get conflicting answer if you again, be, again get B then I'll try one more time, just to, just to be sure. Let's put in 2 here, so we have 2 raised to negative 2, which is same as 1 quarter. Essentially it is same as 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 quarter. And here we have 3 raised to negative 2 plus 1, negative 2 plus 1, let's, let's raise this thing here. And I'm going to raise this part too, because otherwise it gets too crowded. Negative, negative 2 plus 1 is going to be 3 raised to negative 1, which is one third. Which is one third. So which, what's the answer? We're comparing one quarter versus one third. Which one is bigger? One third or one quarter? Of course one third is bigger. One third is bigger and the answer is still B. Answer is still B. Let's try one more time just to be on the safe side, okay? If the third time, if it still doesn't change, then we take our chance. And what I mean by take our chance is that when we're plugging in, when we're not solving it algebraically, when we're just plugging in, you can sit there and try 30,000 times and you keep getting the same answer, but there is not a guarantee that 30,000 and first time the answer might not change. It's just that more time you try, the more little bit of, you feel a little bit more confident. Now let's try one more time, just one last time. No more than that. You understand in the exam you must never go more than three times. There will be insanity to sit there and just keep on going. Try three times if the answer doesn't change, that pick the answer and move on. Very rarely you will find that you try three times, the answer did not change and yet it was not the right answer. If it didn't change, then there's a good chance that that's the right answer. Let's put in x equal to negative 3. So we have 2 raised to negative 3, which is same as 1 8. Because what it is, is 2 raised to negative 3 is same as 1 over 2 raised to 3, which is 1 8. And here we have 3 raised to x plus 1, let's put in 3, negative 3 plus 1, negative 3 plus 1 is going to give us 3 raised to negative 2, which is same as 1 over 3 squared, which is same as 1 9. Well, now which one is bigger? 1 8 or 1 9? Of course, 1 8, 1 8 is 1 8, it's bigger than 1 9. 1 8 is bigger than 1 9. You see, did you notice? The direction of the inequality changed. Here we had B was greater, B was greater, and now A is greater. Now the answer is A. B, B, A. We have a conflicting situation, we have conflicting answers, and therefore for us to have claimed that the answer is B would have been wrong, because in that case, what we would have what we would have ended claiming is that the quantity in column B is always greater, which it is not, as you can see here. 
quantity in column B is not always greater. Sometimes A is greater, sometimes B is greater. Therefore, the correct answer here is D. Correct answer here is D. And the percentile here, I don't know where to put it because it's not a happy situation again. It's only 36%. Fewer than, fewer than two-fifths of the people who took the exam got this question right. Tomorrow we'll pick up from question number six on the next page. Let's see what the situation is on the next page. I believe there are three of them. There you go. We'll do question number six, seven, and eight. Three questions that appear on the next page in tomorrow's video. Okay? Bye now.